in the lone dark valley of shadows for the fairy folk at play yearning i thought of the elf land and the fairy roundelay the islands contain rich mythological history and links to scottish folklore forming an important influence on her appreciation of these however we do recognize the island influence will not have been the only instance where folklore has inspired frank's work scott Scotland as a whole has a deeply powerful connection to myth and legend, these surrounding her, the artist through her entire life and having an impact on all of the, her works. First, we aim to discuss Hannah as a person and as an artist, giving a brief overview for those who do not know of her and her work. Hannah Frank, uh, 1908 to 9, 2008, was a Glasgow Jewish artist who studied at the University at the Glasgow School of Art in the 1920s and produced a large body of distinctive black and white drawings, featured cloaked, long-haired, eerie women. Hannah's haunting drawings are resonant of the Art Nouveau period and with a hint of Aubrey Beardsley and Jesse King. She took up sculpture in the 1950s, studying with Venus Schutz and her drawings and bras sculpture were exhibited in the Royal Glasgow Institute, the Royal Academy and the Royal Scottish Academy throughout her artistic career. She received a posthumous doctorate from the Glasgow University the year after her death for services to the art. We also wish to develop an understanding of the significance of folklore and mythology within our in itself. For example, the village Locranza has multiple mythological stories attached to it. One tale tells of a woman stopping her neighbour from killing a frog perched near the loch. When she returned the next day, she was greeted by a young boy who told her the fairy queen had been disguised as a frog that she had saved. The woman was granted safe passage to the land of the fairies, also known as Fair Elfland, much like in Hannah's form, aforementioned poem. Returning to Hannah's work, there's another line of note from that same poem and the fairy rondelay. A rondelay is a song that is cyclical in melody, but also sang in a physical circle. On iron, there are famed circles of stones supposedly left by the first, Neolith first Neolithic settlers. However, myths started to develop that these were placed instead by mythological creatures and giants, becoming a place of folklore activity. Even one of the most famous circles which resides at Marky Moor is named after the giant Finn McCool. This poem was recorded in December 1925, and from this diary entry where Hannah states, uh, that she met her mother on the Isle of Arran, it is clear that she had not been gone from Arran for long. The folklore and mythology ties to Arran are clear, stemming from the earliest Neolithic settlers to modern day folk tales. We can also start to see aspects of Hannah's work and how it relates specifically to our mythology. We will now go on to discuss some visual analysis examples of Hannah's work. Hannah Frank's Fairies in the Woods is one of her very early artworks. It was completed when the artist was just 17 during the same year her diary included her visits to Arran. The image of feminine community and friendship is executed in the artist's typical monochromatic palette and stylistically similar to her later works, showing the development of the incredibly recognisable style. The focus of the work falls to the fairies and ideas of nature, forming an early indication of the artist's lasting appreciation of Scottish folklore and its links to the natural world, being seen in works that will be discussed later. Poignant additionally is the work's close connection to the 1927th poem Fairy, published in the Glasgow University magazine under Frank's pseudonym Aloe Raff, the pseudonym being inspired by the Edgar Allan Poe poem of the same name. To note additionally is the different spellings of the word fairy, spelt with an AI in the artwork and AE in the poem. Fairy explores the notion of folklore similar to those observed in fairies in the woods, both featuring a group of fairies or fair folk in the dark night woods dancing together to the music the poem describes as the sweetest strain. Created two years apart, the two works appear to mirror each other. Frank in each appears to be observing the same enticing scene unfolding in front of her. The similarities additionally contained in the poem's emphasis of the tall trees and the composition of this work being tall and thin. The dreamlike quality of each is enchanting and enticing, functioning similarly to the spellbinding folklore they portray and de demonstrating the deep inspiration Scottish folklore has throughout Frank's work. Folklore is an intrinsic part of Scottish culture, especially on the Scottish islands, and perhaps Frank's appreciation of this is stemming from her family summer trips to Ayrshire, during which she frequently visited Arran. Fairies or fair folk are prominent throughout our national culture, with many sightings occurring in Arran, specifically surrounding Loch Andro. 
possibly as fair folk are known to protect areas surrounding water and this village is situated on the coast. Fair folk are typically depicted as feminine creatures seen within Frank's work as the figures are clothed in delicate dresses and with intricately detailed wings, all predominantly white against the dark back black background of the nighttime woods. Their delicate femininity should however not na naively be construed as kindness or powerlessness, fair folk being incredibly important and powerful creatures throughout folklore. Existing between good and evil, they have the capacity to do great good to people or if not afforded the correct respect can do great evil, for instance in destroy destroying crops or property. Thus, this feminine definition is emotionally important in Frank's work. Frank's being power and influence, as we may fear seen in her diary entries as her poem Fairy is published in the magazine of my poetry. Frank's continued appreciation of folklore frequently centres around these ideas of power, which can be found throughout nature and contained within the feminine. Women becoming the dominant focal point of many of her works, and with reference to these, and when analysed with reference to mythological creatures, the captivating power may be uncovered. These fair folk portrayed as delicate and pretty hold huge power and we do not simply due to their feminine appearance. Frank's repeated commitment to the Um, I think I has broken up there, so I'll just finish what she was saying. Um, these fair folk portrayed as delicate and pretty hold huge power, which it would be naive to presume they do not possess simply due to their delicate feminine appearance, Frank experiencing the same as uh, shown in her diary entry. Frank's repeated commitment to depicting the intense power possessed in feminine creatures is critical to the lasting power and impact of these works, granting women and nature power is all too frequently assumed they do not have the ability to possess. Uh, now we're going to move on to the second visual analysis. Uh, Hannah Frank's 1950-piece dance is one of unity, warmth and movement, and in conjunction with her diary entries, can be understood as a reflective recollection of her time spent on Arran and in the surrounding Scottish countryside. Dance is characterised by a prevalence of curved lines, starting from the top of the woman's head, expanding through her open arms, and then going downwards, following along the curvature of her body. These curved lines of the figure's body strongly contrast with the floor on the background, depicted in a rather minimal style and reduced to a series of straight lines. The figure's movement is replicated by the seagull, placed near the figure's left arm in the upper third of the drawing. It is in this fragment that the intersection of the woman and the bird occurs, symbolizing a harmonious union of mankind and nature. Frank's use of a seagull within the composition of dance with reference to her personal memories demonstrates the way in which this piece is reflective of her experiences within the Scottish countryside. In the documentary, The Spark Divine, Frank recounts her memory of the time she spent in Ayrshire every summer, remembering the quote, sand, pebbles, maybe water and seagulls, unquote. This mention of seagulls by Frank when recounting her personal memories of the area is important when analyzed in conjunction with the use of it within dance, as it cements the image of the seagull as a visual reminder or prompt for her time spent in the Scottish countryside. The notion of unity is furthered through Frank's choice of a monochromatic color palette and the bright white of both the woman and bird. It is interesting to note that after Frank married Lionel Levy in 1939, the use of white in her work grew. Where she used to favour using black as a way to engage focus in her works, Frank now utilised white in the same way. The connotations of this are evident in the joy that radiates through dance and the parallels of unity, as seen both in the intersection between woman and bird and the union of Frank and Levy, further this through associating this joy with a marriage. In this manner, dance can be again understood as a retrospective reflection of her life. However, given the title of the piece, the movement of the woman, the bird and the reeds become key elements of the visual analysis. The woman's movement exudes and subsuming and embracing energy, which is further emphasized by her open wingspan, evident from her preparatory sketches of this piece. Dance is further enhanced through both the movement and the design of the reeds. 
The curvature of the plants in the foreground follows that of both the woman and the bird, as if the joyful symbiosis of nature and mankind was expressed through dancing. This is especially evident in the bottom left of the artwork in the repetition of the lines that follow along the natural movement of the plant, as if they were blown by a breeze. The emphasis that Frank plays upon the movement reflects a memory that she records in her diary sometime between the 17th to the 31st of July 1932, of which you can see an extract on the slide. In this, Frank writes of how she and her friends dance together on an open air dance floor and how Hannah gained the reputation of being the best dancer at the camp. The combination of this diary entry with the emphasis placed on movement within the piece, alongside the fitting title, Dance, results in an understanding of the piece as a reflection of her time spent on and near Aaron. Overall, Frank's dance evokes strong emotions associated with unity and ideals of the natural world. The piece remains incredibly geometrically ordered, as evident in the majority of Frank's ink drawings, while still conveying the dancing and joy that Hannah Frank experienced while camping in the Scottish landscape. Dance is the perfect result of the order, control, and detail Frank excelled within her works, combined with the overwhelming feeling of ethereal joy, which results in a piece of work that is a wonder to observe, both for pleasure and for study. We want, uh, we want to finish this brief look into the wonderful work of Hannah Frank with the illustration entitled Garden, created in 1932 the same year she visited the Scottish Highlands with her friends at the Glasgow Jewish Student Society. This final piece beautifully ties together everything we've discussed so far. While the title may not suggest an aspect of the supernatural, the composition and subject matter does. Some of the girl's hair is floating what appears to be wind, but other girl's hair lays flat, suggesting something unnatural or magical about the piece. Furthermore, the black dresses of the women melt into the dark background, with the myriad of flowers swirling up around them and becoming part of them. The flora climbs up their figures, all as the background, women and ground become one. The way the flowers hug and clinch them can suggest either them emerging from the flowers or returning to nature. Either way, there is the idea of being one with the earth, and something slightly ethereal about the piece of the result. The hair also starts to meld with the trees, as both the hair and the trees are composed of the same long, thin white lines. There is something supernatural about the composition of the figures, but it's also important to recognise that nature is an important part of folklore. Hannah switches between these fairy with AE and fairy AI, which may seem insignificant, but fairies AE are viewed as the more malevolent of the two. Regardless, many view the fairy as the guardian of nature and their energy is most felt in and around flowers. Tales of fairies causing mischief on iron is also common. According to a midwife's tale, she was walking home from her family's farm when she was, came across a young man by Lake Loch who beckoned her over. He forced her to comb his hair and when she did, Sand and shells fell from his hair. In shock, she ran, only to discover later she'd had a brush with Man and Machir, the god of the sea, who would have forced her back to the fairy world and kept her there. Whether for good or bad, there is this overarching idea of nature and earth as an important part of fairy folklore, making it important when discussing this piece. From the folklore poem, the folklore-based poem mentioned at the start of the presentation, Hannah continues to write this. I dreamt of forms that came from the violet shadows, cloudy, silvery gleaming, of pale cold faces, pale with the moon's ray, the fleeting touch of cold, cold hands, of happenings passing strange. I awoke, I was come from the elf land. She talks of the elf land as a place where pale faces illuminated by the moon's rays, reflected well within this piece, further proof there is something supernatural and folklorish about it. Finally, I want to tie this back to Hannah's specific experience in Aaron she had near the time of the piece's creation. Even though Hannah describes in the previous diary entry as dancing with a male partner, she states that she was one of the best dancers, confirming that the other women danced too. From this diary entry, it was apparent that dancing was done frequently on this trip and amongst all the girls who attended. Looking at, all the, looking at the, top, to the top of the piece, there are tiny stars that are dispersed throughout the flowers and a slither of the moon. The dancing with her friends took place outside under the stars, so it is clear that dancing has had an impact on Hannah's work from our previous analysis of the piece dance. So it is very possible that this work has reminiscent somewhat of that experience as well. The group is also entirely composed of women who are close to each other, picking out flowers and reaching out to one another. There is an idea of female friendship and unity created. In combination with the night sky, this piece is extremely similar to the experience she had in Aaron. 
and beautifully captures the moment of femininity, nature, and folklore together. On this slide, you can observe other three examples of the ink drawings with reference to the elements we have highlighted in this presentation, varying from supernatural entities to folklore stories. Firstly, we have sorcery on the left from 1929. Then we proceed with sea story from the same year and the only artwork by Hannah Frank inspired by a marine theme. And finally, on the right, the mocking fairy from 1931. We hope we have helped eliminate a fraction of the amazing Hannah Frank's work. Hannah Frank had a long and illustrious career during which she spent many years creating depictions of Scottish folklore. As observed through her diaries, poems and artworks, Frank visited Aaron multiple times with family and friends, especially during her youth. By analysing her works and life, we can see how Aaron can act as an inspiration for artists, in this case for Hannah Frank. Additionally observed through the analysis in relation not exclusively to Aaron, but all of Scotland's, Scotland's folklore and mythology, the influence of these are frequently seen throughout her works. For more information on Hannah Frank and our upcoming events, um, please see our social media pages and websites as listed here. Uh, but we've also just included some of the sources we have used, which have been primarily for the folklore and our work. And we also want to just take a moment to recognise the help these sources gave us, as well as recognise the help we've gained from Fiona Frank, the niece of Hannah Frank, and our placement supervisor, Claire Wilson, who helped us um, get this opportunity. Um, and also to Fee and Meg, who are not presenting, but have obviously been a huge help in this project. Um, thank you.